NASA has, of course, been born to help protect the planet, I would argue. And during this period of time that Peter and I have been alive, and he might be a little less inclined to talk about the number of years that is than I am, given he's got boys who are under two and mine are 21 and 18, so I feel the uh, years marching on a little faster, is that during that period of time that we've been born, within actually five days of Peter being born and three days of me being born, the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, stated the goal that humans would go to the moon. This picture taken from lunar distance was about, really, protecting the planet in the sense that at that time, the challenge to the planet was the Cold War. We went, no doubt about it, to beat the Russians. But we have envisioned space in the past in a lot of ways. We've romanticized space. We know that it is a frontier, and we picture ourselves in that future frontier in a way that inspires. And so when Peter asked me to talk about something that we're doing that is transformational and that the technology has gotten to a point where we can do something transformational, I was thrilled to be able to talk about something, but I had a lot of different ideas because I would argue that NASA has transformed the world in many ways. Certainly, we did transform the world in the Cold War arena, having won and now working peacefully in space every day with the Russians. It is transformational. We, when we go to Russia for our launches, I know we would, uh, for a lot of people's purposes, like to say it's a horrible thing that we're working with the Russians and we have to count on the Russians to get us to space, but you know what? We went to fight the Russians in space and now working with them is a positive aspect of what we're doing. What we've learned from space has been transformational in the sense that this picture, again, taken uh, 1969, Earth Day began the next year, 1970, the first, first Earth Day. It was not uh, a coincidence. That happened. It gave us a new perspective on our planet. The information we get from space has helped so many of the areas that uh, we are driving in this discussion here this weekend, energy and health, it is transformational. But there's a specific new activity that's going on that we've not only uh, worked on in the last four years in the Obama administration, but that there's a lot more private sector and nonprofit and citizen interest in, and that is being able to protect the planet for the benefit of humankind in a way that truly can save the planet. We know that asteroid threats have affected the planet Earth throughout our history. This was one of the first known asteroid impact sites. It's Meteor Crater in Arizona. This was the result of about a 50-meter asteroid hit about 50,000 years ago. Asteroids have affected not just Earth, but life on it, right? So just within the period of time that we've been alive, we have absolutely determined that the end of the dinosaurs was from uh, an impact on our planet of a uh, several kilometer size object from space. We have a far side cartoon a lot of us love that says the astronauts, why, what uh, made the astronauts extinct? It's got them sitting around smoking. But what we know is the truth is that they didn't have a space program. So we believe that we have, since 65 million years ago, when that one struck, had a couple of wake-up calls just in the last century. So just over 100 years ago, an asteroid hit Russia in Tungusta, 1908. We know that this impact uh, was something that would have been, if, if it were uh, uh, hitting today, a city killer. We categorize these asteroid impacts today in a way that has uh, been able to identify not only what they were made of, but their impact and the damage. 50 years later, China, and as we know, just two and a half months ago, we had a meteor hit in Russia, Chelyabinsk, and the only technology that we uh, have developed that I think a lot of folks gave attention to with this hit was the dash cam. Uh, who knew 
who knew a dash cam could be so amazing? And the fact that this impact happened on the day we knew there was going to be a close encounter, but also in a place where everyone has a dash cam, that's actually uh, an incredible thing. And, but it's not the only technology that we have advanced since this picture was taken. So we went to the moon almost 50 years ago in order to look back and now drive technologies that can truly protect our planet. And the fact that I think, Peter, in your lifetime, you are helping us do this in so many ways, space being that inspiration for XPRIZE, but now growing to all these other arenas is something that I uh, just uh, have been thrilled to be a little part of. So one of the things that we've been able to do these last few years is advance the observational technologies so that we can track, identify and track large asteroids. We have already, uh, just within the last 15 years, we knew of uh, less than 100 asteroids uh, of this size 15 years ago. We have now categorized 9,000 asteroids and we're uh, able to identify about 20 a week. So this is a technology that has advanced quickly. It is something that NASA spends a very small amount of our budget on, and we are also responsible for, I think, about 98% of the uh, detections today, NASA. It is a global activity. There are private sector interests, but it is primarily a NASA activity. Our budget is $20 million today for this activity out of NASA's $18 billion. But when we got to NASA in this administration, it was $4 million. So we have quintupled the budget for asteroid detection in our time. And with the budget that we've just outlined, we've again asked for a doubling to $40 million. Because while we've got 95% of the planet killers detected so far, we have less than 1% of these city killer asteroids detected. There's a lot of reasons for that. We know that uh, the big asteroids are easiest to find. I'll give you a sort of an overview here of where we are with our asteroid detection. So the planet killers, 95%. We're proud of that. It has all come about in the last couple years. And the technologies that we use to detect these are now available for uh, other uh, innovations as well being used in medical devices and so forth. But for NASA, we have about 65% of them the continent killers, things that really would uh, alter a continent, going down to regional uh, killers, city killers, and finally those below 100 meters, again, meteor crater, uh, Tungusta, all within that realm. In fact, Chelyabinsk was a 17-meter asteroid. That's what we believe now. The uh, damage, we were so uh, lucky to not have deaths of about 1,200 people injured is something that we just know is a wake-up call because what we knew was coming and what traveled between the Earth and the Moon, about 17,500 miles from Earth, was uh, one of these region killers. It would have been in the 100 uh, to 200 meter category. So we know that an aggressive search program is the next step. It's something we can do for a minor part of our budget. We know there are technologies that we have available today, new technologies to do this. But we have to take the next step. We're not going to be able to categorize or identify all of the asteroids until we start viewing these from space. If you just look simplistically from, you can uh, understand that it's very easy to see asteroids away from the sun, looking towards the sun. We cannot see these. That's why we couldn't see the one coming into Chelyabinsk. We had, it was coming from the sun. So we need to go out. We are designing spacecraft that will go out and look back toward the Earth to be able to identify more uh, of these asteroids. And we're not going to get to 100% without going beyond Venus orbit and looking back. But luckily, of course, innovation occurs when the technology is ready, and the technology is ready, and the private sector is actually stepping in. You've got a number of organizations today. B612 is a nonprofit organization that is planning a Sentinel mission that would go out beyond Venus orbit with a spacecraft. They are raising money to do that. 
and they have a number of investors so far working with NASA. We have a Space Act agreement with them uh, to help with their communications activities and the kinds of technology drivers that they'll need. But they are ready uh, to go and provide this public service to humanity. The other couple of organizations, of course, Peter and Eric are involved in planetary resources that is looking to do similar work in maybe some more innovative ways. Another organization, Deep Space Industries, is doing the same. And across the world, people are participating. Most of the work today has been ground-based, and there's a lot of citizen involvement. There are observatories all over the world. This is an area we believe is ripe for potential prizes and challenges. NASA, with our additional budget, is looking to not do this activity ourselves, but partner not only with citizens around the world, but with organizations such as those being uh, started over the last year in order to get this done in ways that are going to cost a little less, involve more people, and really take advantage of the technology that was driven. It's a classical government activity to drive technology, but we're probably not going to be the ones to necessarily solve it. One of the things that, while NASA does identify 98% of what we've got found so far, is that citizens are involved then in characterizing them. And that is absolutely critical as we take the next step. But we go to space for a lot of reasons. And we invest, especially the public's money, for a couple of reasons. Neil deGrasse Tyson gives a great talk about how historically civilizations have invested large amounts of public money for three reasons. Fear, greed, and glory. And I believe that NASA represents all three. We like to think we're just in the glory business. We love our flags and our footsteps. We love the Apollo years. But let's face it, that was really about fear. We did not want to lose to the Russians. But fear isn't as positive a driver as greed. Hopefully, my public affairs folks don't like when I use fear, greed, and glory. They think it sounds uh, so, uh, like we, no one should be greedy. But you know we mean it in the nicest way. It's a great incentive <laughs> for innovation. And I would argue that probably Peter and planetary resources, they don't call themselves planetary defense, they're doing this for the resources. So as we find them, this is a great opportunity to be able to take that next step. We cannot become that spacefaring civilization without living off the land. Asteroids, the moon, are stair steps to space. We aren't going to take everything with us. None of the great explorers did. We went first, of course, uh, west. We sailed the seas largely for purposes of finding paths to do more trade in order to benefit those left behind. And those technologies are what have allowed us to do that in space. Uh, we, we try to do it in the most innovative way possible. And we try to take a page from the Book of the Kings, who when they were looking for, I guess it was Parliament, who was looking to fund the astronomers. You know, the royal astronomers only got money not because people were interested in looking at the stars because they were so beautiful. They were interested in mapping them for purposes of sea navigation so that they could have trade routes. The Longitude Prize is one of the famous ones uh, from several hundred years ago that was all about incentivizing the benefits, uh, incentivizing the development of a technology that would provide those benefits back to the state or the country. So, NASA does play that unique role. We are trying to drive this and partner with others, and we believe that ultimately one of the things we can best do is be able to not only identify these targets that could be threats, but targets of opportunity. And within our 14 budget, we've put forward a mission, a plan to go to an asteroid, actually. We believe we can launch this mission in the next couple of years. It's on the books for 2017 to go robotically, using solar electric propulsion, to capture an asteroid. This is the concept, would be to take the asteroid from the asteroid belt to Earth-Moon distance. We would be in translunar space at L2 in a stable orbit with an asteroid that would not be a danger to planet Earth. We would 
be moving this asteroid to a point where astronauts are already going to be by about 2021 in order so that astronauts could go out, work with the asteroid, bring back large samples. It is an opportunity to capitalize on the existing plans that NASA already has for our human spaceflight program, but also work with the private sector to identify, develop technologies to be able to move one to translunar space. Translunar space is going to be a lot easier to get to as we use new technologies to manipulate asteroids, to be able to potentially mine them for future space travel, and even potentially for future return of uh, elements to Earth. So NASA has been part of this great exploration strategy to reach out, extend humanity's reach, but also be able to benefit from that exploration, to benefit economically for purposes of greed. We don't like to talk about it, but it's absolutely true. Beautiful pictures. We wouldn't have these pictures if we didn't have a space program, but it's about more than pictures. And right now, NASA's plan includes bringing into our economic sphere some of these closer to Earth benefits. Of course, the first A in NASA is aeronautics. We're driving aeronautics research to try and bring not only the costs down, but get the efficiency up, get these, uh, the safety up, and be able to uh, have greater mobility on the planet for all. Beyond that, suborbital uh, plans are something that NASA has been investing in. We're excited for the activities going on in the suborbital world. Virgin Galactic, uh, good luck on Monday with your first power test flight. We then expand out to Earth orbit. The Earth Sciences programs right now 17 operating satellites, and we don't talk enough about heliophysics. Of course, we name it something no one knows what it is, living with a star. Life and Earth itself would not uh, be here without our proximity to our favorite star, the sun. But we're human, and so humans like to explore. This is a highlight of our human exploration program, Space Station, where six astronauts and cosmonauts are living and working in space every day. Lowering the cost to get there is absolutely critical to us, working with private sector companies to be able to get astronauts to and from space so that they can take more than just astronauts. We want to buy seats from US companies, not the Russians, and we want to buy them at lower costs and open up opportunities for all. This includes that deep space vehicle that will take the astronauts to the asteroid, and it includes the robotic spacecraft that will move the asteroid to where we can go get it. But we go beyond with robots. Before humans go, we send our uh, robotic spacecraft. We know that Curiosity rover on Mars has already uh, excited the world with her uh, results, and we have a MAVEN orbital spacecraft going to Mars later this year. Got a depiction here of Juno on her way to Jupiter, and even New Horizons that is on her way to Pluto. Pluto was a planet when we sent New Horizons. Thanks a lot, Neil. It's not a planet anymore. Um, love them, hate them. And our real focus program for science depicted here is the Webb Space Telescope to be launched in 2018, 100 times more sensitive than the Hubble Space Telescope, and the first six months will very likely be able to see the first blue planet orbiting a distant star. Through Kepler and our advances in these technologies, we have been able to see planets in the Goldilocks zone, but we don't yet have the sensitivity to be able to characterize uh, what they are made of. So we will, we think, have more transformative ideas yet to come. But I started with this Hollywood view of the future 50 years ago, and I'll end with a Hollywood view today of really, I think, what everybody's here to, uh, to do. If you could change your fate, would you? Of course, it is wonderful to be here in a room with people who have not only uh, would, but are doing that. And I'm thrilled to be able to join you, and I look forward to having NASA give you as much of the information as we can to help us all change our fates. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>